full disclosure for the audience first, you and I are from the same neighborhood. Yep. Blackburn Hamlet. Both played for the Blackbird Stingers. Stingers yep. represent. Yeah. <laughs> a typical middle class suburban neighborhood outside of Ottawa, mostly white. Yep. And I had this idyllic childhood where I was naive and privileged. And I didn't really even think racism existed in my little perfect corner of the world. What was your experience growing up and playing hockey as a kid? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, for the most part, I, I would have had a similar experience, but part of it comes from, you know, a naivety as, as a young kid where you don't know any better. At a young age, you can identify that you look different from your friends, but you don't necessarily know that you are different from your friends or that you are about to be treated differently than your friends as you grow up. And certainly, you know, playing hockey, I didn't see too many other black families or black players. And probably around like 12 or 13 years of age when I first started encountering my first um, run-ins with just yeah, racial comments or, or racial epithets within the hockey arena or, or with us youth hockey in general. As you progress in hockey and get a little older, does it get worse or are there just these individual once in a while moments? To be honest, I, I, I felt like it got harder as I continued to get further in my career. And it's not so much the blatant, you know, acts of racism, but more the subtleties of being a black man in a business that is operated pretty much exclusively by white men. Every single day I'd enter the arena, leaving a part of myself in my car at home so that I would be more familiar to my peers and to my superiors and my bosses. You, you felt the need to blend? 100%. There's so many things about myself that I would just have to, like I said, leave in the car. I literally sometimes do a check in the rearview mirror to make sure, like, am I appropriate to walk into the arena today where I can guarantee you a lot of my teammates would have never had that thought. Talking dress, hairstyle? Dress, style. hair, all of it. Tiny little diamond earrings that making sure those are out. Yeah, I felt I would have to go an extra mile for that familiarity because when it became a business now, if there's a decision between a guy in a bubble and a guy who's you know going to be the sixth defenseman, it's understandable that in one's bias, they might lean towards like what they're comfortable with. So I would have to do everything I could because where would I have gotten the privilege of this bias being directed towards me when I can't see anyone except maybe a parking attendant who looks like me? Look at it this way, James. My father made sure that my passport picture, I am clean shaven with a shirt and a tie on so that anyone I'm giving my ID to will not come up with their own you know, bias or, or pay me with any type of brush. And that's something I have to do for my identification just to like travel amongst the world. So walking into a hockey arena was the same. I had to make sure that I look a particular way. And to be frank, I still deal with it. I mean. I'm a black executive with the Toronto Maple Leafs, who's actually an alumni with the Toronto Maple Leafs, but there's still moments where I walk into hockey arenas where I'm 100% being profiled and I'm 100% being questioned where my peers aren't, because there's still a, uh, an unfamiliarity. It's like, well, do you actually belong here? So we're Black History Month 2023, and there's progress in the sense that conversations are happening. You're in the position you're in with MLSC. The NHL's certainly made some steps forward. There's the Hockey Diversity Alliance. We're sitting here doing an interview, which frankly, we probably wouldn't have done a decade ago right. to our detriment. Right. But are, are, are you seeing real change out there? Uh, yes and no. I mean, most certainly things are happening and myself and others from a grassroots level all the way up to a pro NHL level, there's individuals 100% fighting the good fight, um, carrying the burden to be able to instill change at the same time, it's very slow and it's, it's not a journey that all of us are on. It's a journey that only some of us are on. And to be frank, a lot of the ones who are us, who are on that journey, are the ones who look like me. So we're the ones advocating and pushing for it, but we need the support of everyone. So the change in some ways is there, but it's, it's, it's a long, long way from where it needs to be. And we still get every, seems like every couple of months as a report in minor hockey of someone. Yeah yelling out racial taunts sure. on the ice or from the stands or in pro hockey in For Europe sure. or wherever it may be. Yeah. That it, must drive you crazy. It does, and to be frank, it's a lot more frequent than every couple months. Some of my peers and my colleagues, former black players, the, the Anthony Stewart's, the Wayne Simmons, you know, we are constantly fielding calls from young black families or racialized families experiencing things. 
they have nowhere else to turn and it's sad because it's not really in my job description to have to speak to these parents or these youth who are dealing with this but there's no rules in place to create discipline for when these things happen and that's a, something I really struggle with I don't understand because you could punch a kid in the head and know what the punishment's going to be but you could call a kid a racial slur on the ice mm -hmm. and there'll be a month long or five month long Process. investigation where you know whatever decision is made is, is more to protect the accused because we don't want to ruin their career path or their journey as they may have made a mistake but we forget about what that's going to do for the victim and the message that is then sent I sat down with your dad in Halifax at the World Juniors as he's now the chair of Hockey Canada. Big part of his job is trying to push for equality, diversity. Mm -hmm. So he's doing it for the red and white and here you are doing it for the blue and white. That's pretty special for a family from Blackburn Hamlet, isn't it? It honestly it really is. It's a bit of a trip to see, see my dad in this, in this position. Well, one of our goals here, we talk about inclusivity, but one of our goals is certainly to change. So when we talk about hockey being our game, we want to change it slightly. Hockey is your game so that everyone feels that, that they can identify and, 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 and be part of this, uh, this great sport. You think back to like some of our experiences, the, the, what's very common in a young hockey player's experience is the car ride home with your parents and the conversation you have afterwards discussing the games. But sometimes those conversations had between, you know, a Jamaican immigrant and his biracial son after a hockey game is different than just what happened on the ice. Driving down to uh, University of Michigan Red Barons and hockey camp when I was a, a, a young teenager and we had to have, as parents would call or as black community calls, the talk. Um, because of something that would have happened to my father at the border. And it wasn't until that they found out that he was a judge that, you know, sentiments changed. Right. And he's been active in social advocacy for a long time. He's had experiences as a former athlete, as an Olympic sprinter and, and, and you know, track and field star for Canada, where my mother, my white mother, had to be the one to get a hotel room instead of him, knowing that they wouldn't probably have success if he walked in first. Those are real things. So to be able to have him now in the hockey space and to do it from such a prestigious level and bring his brand of trust and honor and respect into a very influential position in Hockey Canada, you know, it's, it's proud for me to see that as I try to do it as well for the blue and white. We just watched two black quarterbacks play against each <laughs> yeah. other in the Super Bowl for the first time. Obviously, you want much more than symbolic change. Yeah. But what would be the equivalent in hockey? What would you love to see? A, a black captain oh, hoisting wow. the Stanley Cup? That's a great question. I mean, yeah, it could be like two black goalies, two black captains, I mean, two black coaches. I can get there in my brain, but I don't know if I'll be around to see it. Right. You know what I mean? It's, it's um, such a far distant reality for even someone like myself who's trying to do this work and has my experience. You know, with some of the work that we're doing with Maple Leafs and some other organizations trying to create, certainly on the staff side, trying to create more equitable opportunities for diverse talent. Right and creating a pipeline for them to, to have, you know, better access to these NHL positions. Maybe on the coaching side, that's something that we could see before it happens on the player side. But yeah, honestly, I, I, I can't, it's hard honestly to answer yeah. because it's such a distant future. I, I don't honestly know what it would even look like. As you push uh, in your position for diversity, for inclusion, have you had any moments where you said, okay, this is something, this, this is a step forward? Honestly, yeah. So we have our Black History Month game that's coming up this year. You know, we did our first one last year. And again, we're continuing the theme of celebrating black excellence. Brendan Shanahan didn't wear a shirt and tie to the game that night. And I've never seen that happen. But he, under his suit jacket, he wore a celebrating black excellence t-shirt. And months later, black staff around the arena said, hey, a couple months ago, I saw Brendan wearing this shirt. And I was smiling, being like, yeah, you know, I helped play a role in that. I was backstage at the Hockey Hall of Fame when Herb Carnegie was posthumously inducted. And they kept cutting to you in the crowd, and, <laughs> yeah. and that was as emotional as I've ever seen you. <laughs> yeah, I've gone pretty good in the last few years of letting the emotions out. Um, Why was that moment in particular? Um, I had been along for the last couple of years with the family, the Carnegies, and the Carnegie Initiative team in advocating for Herb to get in. And just like, the weight coming off of, of he's in, and then, you said it, James. I remember you saying like that Bernice Carnegie speech, like that might have been one of the most impactful speeches that the Hockey Hall of Fame has ever heard. It was. We are responsible for making the sport better. We are responsible.
responsible for ending sexism, gender bias, racism, and homophobia. And her ability to come with such passion and conviction of we are doing this. We need to do this and what our game needs for black, for indigenous, for the queer community, for women in the game. It was just so powerful. And what it was was me thinking like, yes, like this has been what I've been like what I've been fighting for and saying for a long time. And but to have one of us, and she's the matriarch in in, in, the, in our black hockey community certainly, and to hear her knowing how long of a journey she's had alongside of her father as well, sharing these messages to finally have that acknowledgement. Um, it was like our truth was finally coming out, you know? So it was, yeah, that's, it was a very emotional time, but a, a celebratory one as well.